And I'd like to uh, introduce to you uh, two very dear friends from the Anglican Communion. First of all, Alison Burnett Cowan, the Reverend Canon Alison Burnett Cowan. She is a Canadian. She's on loan to serve the whole Anglican Communion. Alison was our director of uh, faith, worship, and ministry for a number of years, and in that capacity, uh, Allison gave tremendous <coughs> staff support to Anglican Lutheran conversations uh, over a long, long period of time. She, she saw us through the joint working group to the joint declaration of full communion, and then has con continued to staff the, uh, the joint Anglican Lutheran Commission. She's now serving, uh, as I say, as the director of uh, Unity, Faith, and Order, UFOs. Uh, there are a few of those around the Anglican Communion. Um, anyway, Allison is serving in that uh, capacity uh, and, of course, is traveling the Communion constantly with a major portfolio in, in, with respect to uh, ecumenical dialogues and interfaith conversations. She's traveling uh, the communion, so that takes her into well over 100, 160 countries uh, throughout the Anglican Communion, and we're very, very privileged and very happy, Allison, to have you home uh, for these few days of the assembly. And she's wise, she's taken some vacation time uh, while she's here as well. So, Allison, a really hearty, warm welcome to you. Thank you. Well, it is wonderful to be back home with you all. Lutherans and Anglicans alike, you are my home church. Just as it has been delightful to catch up with the stories of my children and grandchildren over these last few days, to see how much they've grown and how much they can do, it's delightful to see how these two churches have grown and developed over the past few years since Waterloo and before. And to be with you as you undertake something that I think is unique in the ecumenical movement. Two churches in full communion, but not organic union, holding your legislative meetings together so that you can learn together be strengthened by prayer and worship, deepen relationships, and take action together in the service of the gospel. As Fred has said, it's my privilege to be the staff person responsible for all the ecumenical and full communion dialogues of the Anglican Communion. That's with Roman Catholics, Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, recently reestablished after a decade of suspension, Methodist, Reformed, Old Catholic, and of course, Lutheran. And I have to say, without prejudice to my friends and all those other churches, as I said recently when I brought greetings of the Anglican Communion to the Lutheran World Federation Council meeting in Geneva, that Lutherans are Anglicans' closest cousins. So we like family, we're like family reunions when the cousins get together. <coughs> we know lots of the same stories. We have a lot of shared customs. We tell old jokes we both get. But just as with family reunions, there are times when we look at each other and say, how can he or she do that? Where did that come from? And if we are good friends, we will find out and we'll learn from each other. But there's always the danger that we will say, they're just too weird. Let's not ask them next time. So these gatherings are important because they enable us to live together more deeply and more honestly, learning to understand and to treasure difference as well as to celebrate all that we can do together. It's an exciting time to be involved in ecumenical relationships. The ground is shifting and shifting in a positive direction. The fact that three great Christian families, Roman Catholics, Anglicans, and Coptic Orthodox, all have new leaders within the space of about three months, has released new energy for engagement. And this engagement is not just about having theologians sit down to explore past and present differences 
although that remains a vital and central element. It is increasingly acknowledged that the point of our breaking down these barriers is to be together for the life of the world. The Anglican dialogue with Methodists is called Amicum, Anglican Methodist International Commission for Unity in Mission. We have an active body made up of Anglican and Roman Catholic bishops to promote joint witness and action, also a commission tagged for unity in mission. The most recent agreed statement of the Anglican Lutheran International Commission is called to love and serve the Lord, and it's all about shared diaconia, shared service. Thanks are due, of course, to both Archbishop Fred Hiltz as the Anglican co-chair of that last round of dialogue and to Dr. Cameron Harder, who I think is out there somewhere, who served on it from the ELCIC. Next September, we'll see the first meeting of a new body, the Anglican Lutheran International Coordinating Committee. This is not primarily for theological dialogue, although there will be some of that. It is precisely for coordinating the work of Lutherans and Anglicans worldwide, strengthening relationships that already exist and cultivating emerging ones, just as you heard Archbishop Fred and Su Bishop Susan going to Jerusalem to strengthen that relationship. We have lots of work to do together to further God's mission of love in and to the world. And as you probably know, it is your own Bishop Michael Price who will be the Lutheran co-chair of that body. There's another exciting dimension of current ecumenical work. If you look at most of the published statements of international ecumenical dialogues over the last 40 years, you may have observed that nearly all the participants were male, clergy, often bishops, and from universities in the Northern Hemisphere. Today, both our communions are taking steps to ensure a much wider participation. The members of ALEC will come from Canada, Ireland, Scotland, and Australia. And although they'd object to this, they're, they're kind of honorary Northern Hemisphere. But also from Brazil, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Swaziland, Tanzania, and Argentina. We are getting better at having such commissions properly representative of the life of our communions. This is exciting, but also challenging, since it means learning to speak with each other in a variety of languages and from a variety of cultures, both sociological and theological. It means paying attention to translation, not just literal verbal translation either, but making sure that what is said and promoted can actually be understood and applied in a whole variety of contexts around the world. Acting together for mission, understanding each other across difference within as well as between our communions, these are the ecumenical challenges for our time. Unless you think that this is just some remote activity far away across an ocean or two, it's not. The world is here. I imagine that in many of your parishes there are people from many parts of the planet. And if there aren't, Perhaps you could begin to ask why, because they are in your communities. The parish my husband serves has people from Ghana, Antigua, Japan, Nigeria, France, South Africa, and Kenya. People from both our communions now live everywhere. So the challenge is how to understand each other across difference right where we are. In this regard, the long, slow, patient listening of ecumenical dialogues may prove useful experience in our home communities. Thank you for your support and prayers for the Lutheran World Federation and for the Anglican Communion, and may the Spirit of God guide you in this joint assembly as you walk together for the love of the world. Thank you. We also have greetings from uh, Reverend Kenneth, Kenneth, Kenneth Kieran, who is the Secretary General for the Anglican Communion. In that capacity, uh, Kenneth works very closely with the Archbishop of Canterbury's office and is enjoying a, a, a wonderful working relationship with the new Archbishop, uh, Justin Welby had a close relationship, of course, with Rowan Williams uh, through, through those 10 years, but is really enjoying um, Justin Welby's uh, approach to leadership 
and his commitment to reconciliation and evangelism uh, and dialogue uh, throughout the communion as well as faith in the public square. Kenneth, like Allison, uh, travels the world, uh, works out of the Anglican Communion office, and works especially closely as well with the Anglican Consultative Council. We're delighted that Kenneth and his wife Jennifer uh, uh, are both here, and uh, I invite Kenneth now to bring greetings. Bishops, thank you very much for your welcome. I'm very happy to bring very warm greetings to you all from your brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the Anglican Communion. And also to convey in particular to the Anglican Church in Canada, our thanks and appreciation for the various ways in which individuals from that church, from your church, support our common life within the Anglican Communion. It's very dangerous to mention names on an occasion like this, but I can't be present here without thanking Archdeacon Paul Feely, who assisted with communications at the meeting of the ACC in Auckland in New Zealand last year, Bishop Patrick Yu, who's chair of the International Evangelism and Church Growth Initiative, Bishop Philip Poole, who's chair, recently retired president of the Compass Rose Society, Adele Finney, who's taken a prominent role in the Anglican Alliance, Archbishop Colin Johnson, who was until recently chair of the International Commission on Theological Education, Dr. Eileen Scully, who's chair of the Inter-Anglican Liturgical Commission, Janet Marshall, who takes a leading role in the continuing Indaba project within the communion. I list them and I realize in listing people you make an awful mistake because you don't list everyone, but I list them to simply demonstrate the quite exceptional commitment of the Anglican Church in Canada to the life of the Anglican Communion. I hope those of you who haven't been named will understand why, you've, why I haven't been able to list everyone. But I do want to say on behalf of the whole Communion that we genuinely do appreciate that very personal commitment from this church to our common life. You, Archbishop, have already introduced the previous speaker but I think I would have to reserve my most sincere thanks to the Anglican Church in Canada for the very special gift of Canon Alison Barnett Cowan, whom you've just heard speaking. She's now, as you say, Director for Unity, Faith and Order for the whole of the Anglican Communion, an extraordinary brief for which she is very, very able and very capable. Most of you know her very special ability and gifts and the skills that she brings that all she undertakes. And so you will understand my special appreciation of her as my senior colleague in the Anglican Communion Office. And I also know that the new Archbishop of Canterbury already values her opinions and seeks her advice on many ecumenical and doctrinal issues. During the last year, we all said a very grateful thank you to Archbishop Rowan Williams for his years of service as Archbishop of Canterbury and as focus of unity for the Anglican Communion. His scholarship, spirituality, and wisdom provided a very steady anchor for the Communion during a period of extreme testing for our common life. Equally, we welcome Archbishop Justin Welby as the 105th Archbishop of Canterbury in March last. He has begun his ministry with energy and imagination, and also with a very wide knowledge and understanding of the life of the Anglican Communion. He has already articulated his vision for the Communion as a community of reconcilers who themselves are reconciled community of reconcilers who themselves are reconciled in their own life. The Anglican Consultative Council meeting in Auckland, New Zealand last October and November continued the now well-established style of meeting with a strong focus on mission and the work of the networks being at the forefront of all of that. 
with much work done in small groups, and with the sincere desire on the part of the members of the ACC to engage with the missional life of the local church in New Zealand. We claim to be a relational communion. The ACC in particular is striving to live into that reality and making a sincere effort to live the implications of being a relational communion. If I have any criticism of that meeting, it is that at this stage in our history, the ACC itself should become even more world-facing in its deliberations and reflect that in the agenda planning for our next meeting. Of particular note was a change to the five marks of mission of the Anglican Communion, which you, Archbishop, have already referred to. But the change was proposed by this church, the Anglican Church of Canada. Your proposal was to add an additional mark, a mark on reconciliation. After a long and very committed discussion, the proposal was welcomed, but it was felt that the fact that there were five marks of mission embedded in the communion was part already of our DNA. So the council decided that instead of adding an extra mark, as you had requested, that we would modify the fourth mark to read, to seek to transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind, and to pursue peace and reconciliation. Thank you very much uh, for your initiative in enabling that to happen. In common with every church and every church institution, we find ourselves at the Anglican Communion Office short of the funding which would enable us to do what we are asked to do and what we think we ought to do. And in that context, therefore, I'm grateful for the strong financial support and personal commitment that this church, the Anglican Church of Canada, and many of its individual members make to our ongoing communion life. It is deeply appreciated. You know, we often speak of the Anglican Communion as being a gift, an opportunity to share in a global community of fellow seekers after truth and seeking to live into our calling as disciples of Jesus Christ. Archbishop Justin has often spoken about the all too hidden gifts of the Christian Church. And in the context of gift, it was a particular delight for me as I arrived here for your opening Eucharist to meet the Reverend Martin Junge at the opening Eucharist. He, as you know, is the General Secretary of the LWF. And one of the relationships that we treasure at the Anglican Communion Office is our friendship with the staff of the Lutheran World Federation based in Geneva. It began as working with colleagues, but very quickly developed into a sincere and genuine friendship between our two staffs, and one I hope I share with Martin. It is a light, delight, therefore, to experience the same depth, depth and strength of relationship that you two, as Lutherans, as Anglicans together, share here in Canada and are demonstrating within this joint assembly. The brave step forward you have taken in this assembly is a recognition by Anglicans of another gift, the gift and treasure that Anglicans worldwide are finding in their friends in the Lutheran World Federation and in Lutheran churches around the world. Their partnership in the gospel with us, their sharing in God's mission in the world takes on an even deeper meaning and significance in what you are doing here today. And I thank you for it. I truly wish you all God's blessing on your joint assembly and pray that God's grace may be made real in all of your shared deliberations. <laughs>